Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, let's get get going, everyone. Um, before we jump into the presentation and the content, just wanted to pass along a few pieces of housekeeping and logistics. Um, first, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, all of your mics and cameras are off. Um, if you do need to get in touch with us, we ask that you use the Q&A uh, feature that is on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you can use that to message PSRC staff. If you're having trouble with that, feel free to email me directly at bcon, B-K-A-H-N at psrc.org. Um, next, uh, just to let you know, we'll have about 20 minutes for each of our three panel presentations. Um, and we'll plan to save questions for each of our panelists until the end. Um, but in the meantime, also feel free to use the Q&A um, as the panels are going to uh, type in your questions. And following that, we will um, monitor and relay, do our best to relay as many of your questions as we can to our panelists. Um, we'll take a five minute break following the panel discussions and then return promptly for a Q&A that will run until uh, the end of the program at noon. Um, and then lastly, we are posting, or we were, are recording the event and we'll post the videos and slides to our website. Um, and then also just two AICP credits are available if you're looking to log those. Moving on to the event, uh, we're excited today to be here to do a deep dive into planning for industrial lands in our region. Uh, we have staff from three of our biggest cities here today, um, or at least the biggest cities in, the, in Snohomish, King, and Pierce counties. Um, and they're gonna share how they're working to preserve, modernize, and expand opportunities for industrial lands and jobs. Uh, we at PSRC are also in the process of updating the regional industrial lands analysis, and uh, we'll share a bit more about that project today as well. Uh, for our panel, we're joined uh, by Jeff Wentland from the city of Seattle, Steve Atkinson from the city of Tacoma, and Dan Ernesty from the city of Everett. Uh, Jeff will kick us off and discuss Seattle's work to create a future-oriented vision for its two manufacturing industrial centers. Uh, which are facing a lot of pressures to convert to non-industrial uses and displace the fragile but very valuable industrial and maritime clusters that exist in those two um, centers. Uh, next we'll hear from Steve Atkinson from Tacoma who's going to discuss the Tide Flats sub-area plan. Tide Flats is home to the Port of Tacoma and is also a designated manufacturing industrial center but is also the ancestral homelands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians uh, as well as a vital habitat for marine life. So we're gonna hear more about the city's efforts to create a shared long-term vision for the area. Um, we'll end the panel discussion today with Dan Ernesty from the city of Everett. And Dan's gonna talk about um, how the city is working to update and modernize its uh, many legacy mill sites along the Snohomish River and Puget Sound um, and provide an in-depth review of those. Uh, before we switch gears to the panel, I just want to take a few moments to discuss our work in this space. Uh, industrial lands have long been an important area for PSRC and for the region itself. Um, historically and to the present day, many of the region's significant industries and businesses are considered industrial in nature and are major drivers of the region's development and economy. Uh, we last published an industrial lands analysis in 2015, which provided an extensive review of the region's industrial lands, its jobs, and capacity for growth. Um, and there's a lot that came out of that report, but maybe just one statistic to leave you with today is that uh, industrial lands account for uh, about 27% of the region's jobs, so that more than a quarter of the region's jobs exist on industrial lands, um, just to understand score how how important and um, how important they are to the region. Uh, so the city is embarking on their comprehensive plan updates and the fact that it's been several years since that report, uh, we, we at PSRC are in the process of updating the regional industrial lands analysis. You know there's a lot of reasons why we're doing this work but there's three sort of guiding questions that are are kind of setting this up and things that we want to accomplish through this. The first is what are the trends and changes that are impacting industrial lands? 
what's new that's changed since 2015 and what are cities planning for? Um, in what ways can the update inform local planning efforts in industrial, for industrial lands? So how can we actually provide better data and information so that cities can do better planning themselves? Um, and then uh, how can the update help improve or identify strategies for equitable access to employment? Um, we'll discuss this a little bit more, but just ensuring that um, these industrial jobs oftentimes you know, providing better than average pay and benefits. How can we make those better, more accessible to BIPOC populations um, and other communities that typically don't have as great of access to them? Um, so to help us answer these questions, we're working to understand issues, conditions, and trends uh, through outreach. Uh, over the spring, we did a lot of activities uh, one was administering a survey to local jurisdictions, but also more direct conversations with uh, cities, um, but also ports, uh, tribes, and community groups, and we plan to continue this outreach throughout the summer. Um, and then the other part of it is updating the industrial lands data, uh, so planning to do an extensive update, including revisiting the inventory of industrial land, seeing if the region still has enough capacity for uh, growth to 2050, and updating uh, our sub-area profiles. To give you a sense of what we've heard so far in our outreach conversations and what we're seeing as priorities for the update, uh, perhaps the most frequent comment we've heard is just on the rapid growth of warehousing and distribution. I'm sure that we're all aware of the explosion in e-commerce generally over the past couple decades. But what might be less well known is how that is impacting land use. Um, the massive fulfillment centers that uh, we think of as, you know, uh, this Amazon fulfillment centers or other e-commerce uh, companies, uh, these warehouses can't just be built anywhere. Um, they're often limited to these industrial lands. Um, and as a result, communities are seeing a lot of pressure to uh, uh, site more of these centers to that in an, that end up displacing more traditional industrial activities. Um, another thing that we've heard is that we need more opportunities for light and small scale manufacturing. Uh, unlike core industrial activities, like what we think of with our ports, um, it is possible for many small scale manufacturers to coexist with other land uses, including residential. Um, and as a result of that, cities are looking for more ways to provide flexibility and encourage more local manufacturing at that scale. Um, the last thing that we've heard kind of at a broad level is that industrial lands need to work better for the people in our communities. As I said before, more than a quarter of the region's jobs are, are on industrial lands um, and are typically better than, than the average job. Um, in terms of pay and benefits. Uh, but again, the, the lack of opportunity for these jobs to particularly BIPOC populations, non-native English speakers is uh, something that cities are identifying as a thing that needs to be improved. Um, so just a very brief look into the data that we plan to update. Um, there are three sort of main buckets we're looking at with this. Uh, first is the industrial lands inventory. So we'll look at all industrial land across the region, um, how that has changed since 2015, what the current supply is, and if there's capacity to uh, grow to 2050. Uh, we'll also update our employment and wage data to get a sense of what types of industrial jobs are prevalent throughout the region and where they are. And then we'll uh, review the sub area profiles to identify market trends and more specific local concerns. Up to this point, we've been focused a lot on engagement um, and just trying to understand more uh, about the issues impacting local communities. Um, but we are starting to make a lot of progress on our data collection and analysis, thanks to the really fantastic work by our in house data staff. So just a shout out to Carol Nido and Mike Jensen. Um, doing great work to pull all that for us. Um, but we're going to continue to hold conversations with our partners and in particular um, look to have more of an emphasis on um, reaching out to community organizations, tribal governments, and others kind of more at the local level. Um, and then aiming towards the fall or at least the end of 2022 to provide a more detailed update and release a final report. 
So that's all I have to say about our work at this point. Um, but I uh, just wanted to say if you're interested in learning more or have some thoughts about what our industrial lands update should consider, we would love to hear from you. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me um, at my email address. Uh, I'll provide it after the, the event as well. Um, but for now, we will turn to our panel um, so we can learn more about some of the excellent on the ground work um, being done for industrial lands. And so I will turn it over to Jeff Wentland from the city of Seattle. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ben. And thank you, PSRC, for, for having me today. Um, I also really look forward to hearing from um, the peer cities as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have some slides. Um, so, Ben, do you see the slideshow? Just want to make sure. We see the slides. It's just in the, the normal PowerPoint, not the slide, the slideshow view. Um, let's see here. I think this works fine. I, I okay. think I can, it's, it, I can see it pretty well. All right, well, I will, I'll will just go ahead then, thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, uh, and did you see the slide advance? It looks like it's still on the, the main, or the first slide. Okay, hold on here. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, how about now? Still on the first slide? Yeah. I might suggest you reshare. Okay. Let's try this. Okay. So now, you, now we're seeing like the, the, I don't know what it's called, yeah. the, with your notes and the Got next it. slide. <laughs> um, how about now? There we go. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank so, you. sorry. Bear, thanks for bearing with us. Yep. All right. I'll be talking about some work that the city of Seattle has done on what we're calling uh, an industrial and maritime strategy, and this work has been ongoing over a couple of years. Um, so, just for background, um, Seattle has two of the regionally designated manufacturing industrial centers. Um, the Ballard Inner Bay North End MIC and the Greater Duwamish MIC. And you can see on the map, they're uh, on either side of uh, Elliott Bay and uh, downtown Seattle is kind of at the center of the map on your screen. So we always start with the why of, uh, why does the city um, uh, have policy to encourage and protect industrial land? And uh, the why is that the, there are over 95,000 jobs uh, on, on these lands, which represent about 15% of Seattle's total jobs. Two thirds are accessible without a traditional four-year degree, and many remain unionized with uh, high quality benefits and good starting salaries. And uh, <clears throat> these lands are in irreplaceable locations near irreplaceable assets of the deep water port, as well as uh, freight and rail infrastructure. And they provide a certain stability to, to the economy. Um, they typically, we, we don't see as much fluctuation uh, with economic cycles in jobs on these lands. Um, so we, we've done uh, a, a, a number of data collections recently and, and we look forward to PSRC's data collection as well. But um, you know, we're looking at different sectors that you see on the screen here uh in 
the mix. And uh, it's notable that jobs in industrial sectors are growing at a rate of about 1.4% per year. Um, often folks don't sort of recognize that there is ongoing job growth in these areas. 55% of the jobs in our industrial areas are industrial. And uh, some of the specific industries or sectors that have been growing more uh, on these lands are information and computer technology, uh, distribution and e-commerce as Ben mentioned, as well as food and beverage production, uh, maritime and construction. Uh, just to give you a little sense of uh, these two manufacturing industrial centers, uh, the Ballard Interbay North End MIC um, has about about 60% of the land area uh, is in industrial land use. And some of the notable uses include uh, Fisherman's Terminal, which is on Salmon Bay and is home to much of the Pacific fishing fleet that goes up to Alaska. There's still a good amount of seafood processing that takes place here. There's sort of a growing uh, brewery district in and around Ballard. <clears throat> and uh, there continues to be a network of shipyard and marine support services um, uh, that you know service the fishing fleet here. There's also a, a rail yard present uh, in this manufacturing industrial center. And the Greater Duwamish Mick, which is along the Duwamish Waterway and River uh, that empties to Elliott Bay, has a much higher percentage of existing land area in industrial use. Um, some of the notable uses include container port terminals um, operated by Port of Seattle and the, uh, the uh, Northwest Seaport Alliance. So there's a network of logistics and distribution uh, throughout the MIC that you know kind of relies on the port. There are two rail yards uh, in this MIC. We also have a lot of auto dealerships and repair and the professional sports stadiums uh, are, are in this MIC. Um, so these are uh, some of the main pressures that, that uh, we're seeing in Seattle on the industrial lands. So at the top of the list here is that we're planning for four new or expanded light rail stations that'll be in manufacturing industrial centers. Um, they're at uh, Soto, uh, two in Interbay and one in Ballard. So we're really looking forward to uh, proactive planning for, you know, what's appropriate uh, land use policy for transit oriented areas in uh, a manufacturing industrial center. Uh, the city also has, the city and region has a housing crisis, we know, and uh, we regularly receive requests to allow housing uh, in industrial areas. We receive comprehensive plan amendment requests almost annually um, for those types of changes. So there's intense pressure to add housing everywhere, including uh, to industrial lands. Uh, our city's policies and zoning don't, don't currently allow uh, housing on industrial land. Uh, we also have seen some unintended uh, loophole type development in industrial lands for things like mini storage warehouses, uh, box retail stores, and some standalone offices. So those aren't really industrial in nature, but they uh, uh, do gobble up some land. Uh, and we're also noting the emerging changes to the nature of industrial activities. So, um, you know, smaller, less uh, impactful uh, manufacturing and making uses that um, can uh, be co-located with other uses, um, as well as uh, industries themselves that are um, more design oriented, um, you know, function more like office uses, but, but do have a connection to industrial activities. So th these are the pressures and uh, trends that our work is responding to. Uh, the other major uh, factor is environmental justice. Uh, so as Ben mentioned, uh, residential communities in Seattle near the mix have borne disproportionate impacts. Um, particularly, I'm speaking of the Georgetown neighborhood and the South Park neighborhood. Both are largely surrounded by uh, industrial lands. Um, so data show 
lower life expectancies, for example, um, um, for populations in those neighborhoods. Um, so livability improvements are needed. Things like uh, safer, uh, safer streets, uh, more tree planting and landscaping. Um, and we're really trying to work towards partnerships with uh, industrial users that transition to cleaner and greener practices. Uh, and so we hear loudly from these communities um, that are nearby the industrial areas. Um, so the city worked with uh, an advisory council um, over 18 months and in May of 2021 arrived at a package of 11 high level strategies um, with, with uh, a consensus. And that was really difficult to reach uh, with a variety of stakeholders. And we're moving to implement uh, some of those uh, recommendations. Uh, we also included outreach to over 100 BIPOC youth through that process to learn about their understanding of access to jobs in these sectors. So I'm gonna focus on the land use strategies today and I'll, uh, I'll dive into that in the next series of slides. But uh, it's important that we regarded this as a holistic strategy where workforce investments, transportation improvements and the like um, were, you know, uh, strongly desired by the stakeholder group. Um, so we're moving forward with um, proposing land use and zoning changes in response to that consensus. Um, we released a draft environmental impact statement in December of last year um, and hope to release a final environmental impact statement this summer. Uh, comprehensive plan text policy changes and some possible zoning updates uh, would follow uh, the final EIS. And our required MIC sub area plan updates uh, would incorporate these efforts. Uh, so essentially, the city is proposing to update its land use policies and zoning categories for industrial lands. And we would update them into these three new categories. Uh, and I'll describe uh, each of these in the next series of slides. So the first category uh, titled Maritime Manufacturing and Logistics, um, the intent is to strengthen established economic clusters and expand equitable access to jobs. So here we're really strengthening the protections for uh, core and legacy industrial lands. Um, and some of the ways that would occur would be very stringent thresholds for removing any land from a MIC in the future. We're proposing to only allow that at the time of a 10 year major comprehensive plan update. Uh, and we would also close some zoning loopholes uh, in this zone that have allowed for um, incompatible development like box retail uh, and offices. So things like reduced maximum size of use limits for non-industrial uses. So this is really an intent to protect the core and legacy industrial areas. Um, and this diagram just illustrates that intent. Uh, it would be located close to the ports uh, and close to major infrastructure and would be intended to provide long-term predictability for industrial businesses to invest. Okay, the second concept, uh, and this is, we're getting now into the more forward-looking, um, proactive, um, future-oriented concepts. So we're titling this Industry and Innovation, and it would be intended to support economic innovation and capitalize on emerging emerging opportunities. Um, so this is, um, this would be focused near the future light rail stations. And we'd uh, encourage innovation in industry by allowing um, much bigger and denser uh, buildings with offices, research uh, and design uh, if they, can be combined with light industrial activities and in a development. And I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, so encouraging a density of employment, transit oriented development uh, near future light rail stations. And this is also intended to spur investment because 
many of the city's uh, industrial lands have very old infrastructure, um, lack street improvements and the like. So with some additional density, we uh, envision upgrades to those um, features. And this is also intended to generate you know, new bona fide industrial space. Another thing we've heard is that some of those small maker type businesses that start in Seattle uh, can't find space to grow in. So this also responds to that by generating uh, investment in new spaces. And the diagram shows you that this would generally be located within a quarter to a half mile of light rail. And uh, this is depicting how a ground floor um, or two potentially of uh, light industrial uses um, could be at the bottom of a building with you know, multiple stories of dense employment um, above that. And we would do that through uh, an incentive bonus system. Okay. Uh, and the third uh, concept is the uh, urban industrial concept. This is intended to create vibrant districts um, near neighborhoods. Um, so picture relatively small, um, affordable spaces for arts and light industry. Um, this would be located at the edge of neighborhoods, including South Park and Georgetown. Uh, and in some of the studies, we're looking at a very limited quantity of affordable workforce housing here. Um, so this is the image, um, the, the concept image of what that would look like. It also include much higher standards for landscaping, street improvements and tree planting and the like. Okay, so um, I'll wrap up in just a minute, but uh, I just wanted to show you a map of uh, how these new zones could um, apply uh, in our two manufacturing industrial centers. The north uh, is to the left of this map. So the white circles are showing you where the, um, approximately where the new or expanded light rail stations will be. So you see the purple uh, industry and innovation concepts near those, those future light rail stations. Um, the blue is the maritime manufacturing and logistics, that protective uh, industrial zone. And that would still comprise um, 86% of all the land uh, in the mix. And the urban industrial in gold you see um, near um, some neighborhood areas, um, you know, such as near the Georgetown neighborhood, near the South Park neighborhood, near the stadiums, uh, and uh, near, near Ballard. Um, so just a few other words. Um, Again, the city views this as part of a holistic strategy. And uh, we, we hear that you know, freight supportive mobility investments are absolutely necessary, transportation investments um, to correspond with the land use strategy. Um, so the city will be renewing its transportation levy. And uh, we're working with stakeholders to look at the type of freight mobility improvements that could, could be a part of that. Uh, the city is also working on things like electric truck charging stations uh, in the mix, um, as well as truck only parking regulations. And we're also working on a suite of workforce development um, activities. Um, the city increased its allocation for employer based career co connected learning programs uh, in the 2022 budget. Uh, so it's not just land use, um, and I will conclude there. Thank you, and I uh, look forward to the discussion uh, later. Fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we will now turn it to Steve Atkinson from Tacoma. Um, and just to mention again, that if you have any questions for our panelists, be sure to put them in the q and I've seen a couple come in, just wanna make sure everyone has a chance to do that. And I'll turn it over to you, Steve, thank you. Yeah, great, thank you, Ben, and great to be here today. Um, uh, fantastic to get to see what um, 
you know, the, the progress being made in Seattle. Um, I'll just say sort of as by way of introduction, we are um, also in the process of developing a subarray plan for Tide Flats, uh, Mick in Tacoma. Um, we're a little bit, I think, kind of behind in terms of kind of where, you know, City of Seattle is in that process. So I'll be talking a little bit more today um, about some of um, uh, some of the unique uh, kind of methods through which we're doing the subarray planning. Um, I will pull up the screen, get started on the presentation, um, and make sure uh, everything is working correctly. Um, all right, so hopefully uh, this is showing up uh, well on the screen. Uh, so kind of characterizing this a little bit as uh, some of my reflections on industrial land use planning in Tacoma's Tide Flats. Uh, some of the emerging policy tensions that we're seeing uh, through our early community outreach and engagement and through the EIS scoping period. Um, and then a little bit about the promise and potential of the joint planning work in through which we're doing uh, the summary plan itself. Um, so just a, a couple of quick things. Um, wanted to just recognize that hey, this is a project that's being done uh, jointly uh, between uh, City of Tacoma, City of Five, Pierce County, the Puyallup Tribe of Indians and Port of Tacoma. Um, so that's one of the things I'll talk a little bit about through this uh, presentation today um, and wanted to acknowledge uh, just really the kind of the fantastic uh, folks that I get to work with uh, at those jurisdictions and acknowledge uh, uh, Deirdre Wilson with the Port of Tacoma who I saw in the audience today and just really want to recognize um, and appreciate uh, all of their contributions through this work. Um, so this will represent not so much a kind of a, a uh, presentation on behalf of the project management team, but some of my reflections on the work that we're doing. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, so kind of the first couple of slides will be a brief orientation. I just make sure we're um, kind of all aware of the area that we're talking about. Uh, here on the left, you can see the manufacturing industrial center boundary. Uh, this is our general study area for the Tide Flat Summary Plan. Um, as Ben introduced, um, it's over 5,000 acres of waterfront. Uh, with vital saltwater and estuary and habitat. Um, likewise, uh, it's the ancestral lands of the Gallup Tribe of Indians. Uh, it's designated as a port MIC, uh, and it's the home of Tacoma and Pierce County's highest concentration of manufacturing activity. So around uh, 10,000 employees directly within uh, the Tide Flats um, and a significant uh, economic impact uh, far beyond uh, these boundaries. Um, in terms of kind of the overall layout of the area, um, it's a fantastic, I think, just view of the Tide Flats and, and a really a, a nice image to contextualize the area that we're planning for. Um, so just in this image, you can see generally um, kind of starting from right to left, uh, downtown Tacoma uh, here on the right-hand side along the Theofoss Waterway. Um, the study area really starts on the east side of the Theofoss Waterway. We do have uh, significant public access, recreation, kind of marine oriented uses on the Foss Waterway. Um, a lot of mixed use development happening um, kind of in that area. You can see some of the marinas located there. Um, as you start to kind of move um, then across the Tide Flats, you can see the Tacoma Dome um, and uh, this area here where we've got uh, sort of a transition from downtown to the, the MIC. So we have a downtown regional growth center uh, that abuts uh, the manufacturing and industrial center. Um, and we have two light rail stations proposed, uh, one in South downtown um, and then one uh, in this general vicinity uh, here around Portland Avenue and Puyallup Avenue. Um, the port operations, general terminal facilities, uh, you'll see concentrated uh, predominantly along the Blair Waterway and the Sitcom Waterways. Um, and then obviously you can see the Puyallup River and the broader watershed uh, coming down into the Tide Flats here. Uh, we have significant habitat sites really uh, interspersed throughout uh, the Tide Flats. Um, a few of those are evident just here in the image, the Goatly Heidi wetlands um, along the Puyallup River. Um, and one I'll, I have an image of a little bit later in the presentation uh, called Place of Circling Waters uh, here uh, along Hylobos Creek um, and the Hylobos Waterway. Uh, you can also see some of the recent uh, development, a lot of the you know, kind of white roofs uh, indicating some of the warehousing, uh, logistics and distribution facilities that have been uh, developed recently in the Tide Flats. Um, that's, uh, uh, but, but again, I think contextually you can really see, I think in this image, um, also the economic relationship between the Tide Flats uh, and our adjacent jurisdiction. So you can see uh, certainly some of the land use change that's happened in Fife, uh, Puyallup, um, and the Sumner Pacific uh, Manufacturing Industrial Centers. 
um, really resulting from the trade uh, that happens through the Port of Tacoma. Um, we also have uh, you know, some significant uh, vacant underutilized lands within this area, um, largely concentrated um, along the High Lobos waterway, and then some areas of general industry um, along that, uh, that waterway as well. Um, and again, one of the, the focal points of our planning is, is often as well around the, the relationship of the tide flats with surrounding communities. Um, so along uh, Northeast Tacoma, you can see there's a steep slope, uh, a pretty significant green belt, uh, but also some recent ha housing developments uh, within the last 10 to 15 years that have been uh, starting to encroach uh, on the Port of Tacoma. And that's been one of the focal points for our planning work as well. Um, so we have a number of circumstances really on the, on the edge of the MIC, uh, where you have significant residential development, uh, mixed use downtown development happening, uh, really kind of right um, across the water or um, abutting uh, the manufacturing industrial center. Um, <clears throat> again, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy framework, but everyone here will probably be pretty familiar I mean, with all of these uh, kind of general policies that we follow in, in our local planning. Um, I'm going to try to highlight just a few things I think are particular to um, not just to Tacoma, probably to Seattle as well, uh, and maybe some other jurisdictions, but some of the unique things that we're working on uh, through this process. So uh, one in particular is uh, under the Growth Management Act, we are one of two jurisdictions that are required to plan under the container port provisions of the Act. Um, and one of the unique things within that is uh, that there is a requirement for collaboration uh, with the Port of Tacoma um, that is really unique to that, uh, that chapter of the Growth Management Act. I don't think the term collaboration is used anywhere else in GMA. Um, and so this is really an opportunity where we're trying to take that collaboration to heart and really try to, to think about what does that mean in terms of the process that we're constructing um, and how we think about the, the types of outcomes that come out of that, this planning process. So that's again, one of the really unique, I think, characteristics of this work um, are those collaboration provisions that we're integrating into our planning partnerships. Uh, the other is, is with the Puyallup Tribe. Um, uh, this is uh, kind of a theme that'll run through some of the other slides, uh, but the Port of Tacoma Manufacturing Industrial Center, as I mentioned, is also um, a part of the ancestral lands of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Uh, it's within the tribal reservation. Uh, I think you can see on the maps, uh, on that first map, there's a uh, tribal survey line that runs through the tide flats. Um, and so we do have obligations to protect tribal treaty rights, uh, to ensure consistency with those rights, as well as um, requirements for consultation with the tribe through the land claim settlement agreement that we have um, with the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Um, so again, that sets some of the stage for a higher uh, level of, of direct uh, planning um, uh, that we have with the port and with the tribe. Uh, we think kind of go above and beyond some of the general coordination requirements we typically uh, work with under the Growth Management Act. Um, and, and so one of the things too that I'll try to highlight in some of the, the policy tensions that I'll speak to, um, likewise, is kind of thinking about then um, how these policies are often kind of framed as um, kind of different layers, you know, kind of from a broader policy down to more specificity as you get closer to the local level. Uh, but in some ways, I think what we're going to be identifying through this work are some of the tensions in and among these different policy frameworks that we plan under. Um, and then hopefully at the end of this process, identifying some ways to, to think about through, uh, through vision, uh, through our uh, regional planning and coordination, um, some ways that we can try to resolve some of those planning tensions. Um, we are, again, very uh, kind of a, at an earlier stage of our planning work on the summary plan uh, than we were heard from, from Jeffrey uh, in Seattle. Uh, we're at a point where we've conducted the community visioning process for the Tide Flat Summary Plan. Uh, we're now in uh, the EIS scoping phase. And um, uh, at the same time that we've been doing the summary planning work, I want to identify that there's been a, a significant amount of other uh, projects, processes, and community engagement that's been happening um, at the same time. And so as we've been doing our summary planning work, we're already also trying to take into consideration um, kind of what we're learning from these other related projects. Um, again, folks in our community may, um, you know, may kind of engage or interact with planning processes in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, some people are really focused on participating in things really directly about the tide flats. Um, other folks are participating in planning process because they care about a particular issue. Um, and so we're trying to think about how we take those kind of more issue-based comments uh, from other engagement processes and really bring those to bear on the work that we're doing within the summary of plan. 
So just a few of those I wanted to highlight here. Um, so the visioning process has been really key. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going through the EIS scoping phase now. Uh, likewise, though, uh, over the past uh, few years, since the suburb planning process started, uh, the City Council had also enacted interim regulations that went into effect um, at the same time as the initiation of the subway plan. Um, and as anyone who's done interim regulations or moratoria knows, uh, that requires a, a six-month extension process, public hearings, public comment periods. Um, so that's something where we, we received a significant amount of ongoing engagement really every six months for around three years uh, during this process. And that, that phase uh, really helped, I think, um, identify some of the key policy issues that we're going to be grappling with through the summary plan. Um, related to that, uh, we've been doing our climate action planning and adaptation strategies, uh, also recognizing work that's being uh, done and is ongoing uh, through the Puyallup Tribe of Indians comprehensive planning uh, process, um, and have definitely considered uh, the uh, input from the Port Tacoma strategic planning work as well. Um, so a really significant number of people have been engaged in this uh, in this work. And um, so that kind of brings me to a slide I'm going to spend a few minutes on, um, kind of walk through each of these bullet points to try to highlight, you know, kind of what I'm framing as policy tensions. Um, although I, I appreciate, I think, the way Jeffrey put it is sort of some of the pressures uh, that we're experiencing in the process um, and through which we're hoping that this process can provide some resolution. Um, so one of those that I would I'd kind of start with is a broader theme about flexibility versus prioritization. Um, so we have a couple of different uh, policies that we work under. One is uh, under the container port element of the GMA. Uh, we are, uh, part of our requirement is to ensure that there's flexibility uh, to uh, respond to emerging markets. Um, that might not be a direct quote, but it's probably pretty close. Um, at the same time, uh, in GMA, in that same element, as well as under the Shoreline Management Act, we have um, use priorities that we're supposed to be implementing. Um, and so that's been, I think, through the community engagement, one of the themes that's really emerged is kind of how much industrial flexibility uh, should the area provide for um, versus how much should we be trying to use our zoning and development regulations to really reserve land for uh, specific prioritized uses. Um, and a subset of that, I think, is a conversation on generalization and specialization uh, within the area. Um, again, how much should our economic goals and policies and strategies really focus around um, kind of building on certain competitive advantages versus uh, providing for opportunities for diversification of, of uh, economic activity um, and the workforce. Uh, the second I'm identifying here is some of the um, kind of conversations around uh, the ways we take into account global versus local impacts. Um, one, one example of this, I think that they kind of will hopefully uh, help clarify, I think, the some of the ways that we're thinking about this in Tacoma uh, pertains to our greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, so one of the competitive advantages I think we have in Tacoma, uh, one of our use concentrations is energy production. Um, and um, one of the things we've heard significantly through our process from the community is, is an interest in um, advancing kind of a green economy, uh, green industry, renewable fuel production, um, as, a, as a distinct economic opportunity within the tide flats. And so that renewable fuel production has been, um, I think, really at the forefront of people's minds in terms of the economic opportunities in Tacoma. Um, one of the challenges of that, and one of the interesting tensions is because we have adopted greenhouse gas reduction targets, um, is really many of those businesses could potentially result in an increase in local greenhouse gas emissions while simultaneously helping support more global and regional air quality improvements and GHG reductions. Um, and I think that's a, a tension that was, I think, acknowledged in some of the clean fuel standards that were adopted at the state level. It is a recognition on um, that tension. Uh, again, this is something we've not yet resolved, uh, but I expect that that'll be at the forefront of some of the policy conversations. Um, likewise, um, if you have businesses or industries that have, again, um, potential for um, kind of more uh, kind of broader regional state global um, environmental benefit, but introduce uh, some potential risks or potential uh, adverse impacts into the local environment. And we can think about this as, you know, air quality impacts on adjacent neighborhoods. Um, how much weight or deference should we give to 
uh, one of those uh, global or more local impacts and making decisions about what kinds of uses are appropriate within the area. Um, from an employment density and land supply, um, this has been, I think, a really critical one. And again, we just had a meeting last night where this uh, really, I think, emerged again as a topic of conversation. Uh, we have employment targets uh, in Vision 2050. Uh, we have to ensure that to maintain our MIC uh, certification and status. Uh, we have a land supply and zoning capacity to accommodate 10,000 more jobs within the Typhon. So essentially doubling the number of uh, uh, people who would work uh, within that area. Um, at the same time, we've gotten a lot of public input. Again, uh, one, reinforcing uh, the need for expanded, uh, expanded employment. Uh, at the same time, a lot of concern about um, if we prioritize specific types of uses, whether that's container shipping or renewable fuel production, um, certain types of, types of industrial sectors generally have lower employment densities. Um, and so that's really emerged as another one of those policy tensions. If we prioritize and seek to take advantage of specific types of economic opportunities, is that in contrast or does that contradict in some way uh, the goals and policies around employment density and employment concentration within the area. And again, if we if we end up uh, coming out of this with a plan that, look, the uses that we want to support in this area um, may mean that we will have a difficult time achieving the, the jobs targets that we have regionally. Um, if we're going to assume that we're going to have a lower employment density within the tide flats, then what does that mean for the broader land supply we need, not just in Tacoma, but within Pierce County to make sure that we can accommodate uh, the levels of employment growth that we need to accommodate. Um, so that, that could be another one of those tensions. And again, one of the, the comments that we hear frequently is not all jobs are created equal. Some jobs have greater multipliers. And again, how much weight should we give to jobs and industries that would uh, provide employment within Tacoma versus uh, sectors and industries that would have a broader economic impact or maybe achieve higher overall employment growth, but it's not as concentrated within the city of Tacoma. Um, again, kind of related to both uh, the impact and employment scenarios, um, really hearing a lot uh, through our process about supporting uh, green, clean, carbon-free um, uh, jobs. And, and I kind of frame this that there isn't a consensus at the moment around kind of these concepts. We hear all of these. It's about a green economy. It's about green industry. It's about green jobs. Likewise, it's about a clean industry or clean jobs or a clean economy. Um, so folks are really thinking about this in a lot of different ways. There does not seem to be an emerging consensus yet around exactly what this means. Um, but we're hearing a lot of support for diving into this topic. What would that mean? How would we define that um, locally? Um, and we're hearing that both from environmental organizations and advocates within Tacoma, um, as well as from uh, some of the industrial businesses within the Tide Flats, um, who are all, I think, at a high level kind of in in some agreement about uh, the desirability of, of supporting uh, green economy. Um, we do, to, to be perfectly frank here, a lot of pushback on the term green and, and the way that we talk about this and whether or not it, it um, you know, excludes other businesses that are not necessarily high polluting or you know, traditionally thought of as sort of as, as more impactful. Um, and so there's a lot of focus on how do we define this in a way that is inclusive, um, and thinks more about potentially not just economic sectors that we would try to attract to Tacoma, but how we can support existing businesses as well transition to uh, cleaner production processes. Um, the land use buffer is transitions and compatibility. I'll just say um, there's sort of often within the public imagination that we hear through public comment and testimony, um, sort of this idea that the Tide Flats um, is sort of like a series of concentric circles or the planning should be a, a series of concentric circles with each circle being almost like a transect of uh, use, uh, size, intensity, um, emanating out from a, a center where you have the most intensive uh, activity um, and then transitioning out broadly to the neighborhoods and areas surrounding the tide flats. And while we have some traditional planning that is uh, kind of framed around that concept, and in a lot of ways, the tide flats um, has some natural advantages uh, with the waterways and the hillsides around it that kind of create some of those transitions. One of the ways I think this is going to show up uniquely within Tacoma, um, it really relates back to uh, the ancestral lands of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians and the tribal reservation. 
um, that this is an area that is uh, where the, the reservation and the MIC are coincident, they're commingled. Um, and I think that's going to give uh, a really unique shape to the conversations around land use compatibility um, and how we ensure that we have uh, an environment that still supports manufacturing and industry, but still ensures uh, a healthy environment and uh, the ability for the Puyallup Tribe of Indians to be able to maintain uh, the reservation as a place to live, work, and practice their, um, their traditions. Um, lastly, again, uh, probably uh, not quite lastly, but um, I don't want to take too long on this. Um, uh, I think as uh, was mentioned uh, by Jeffrey in Seattle, uh, we have a similar circumstance with the tension between traditional transit-oriented development and kind of a, a introduction of a concept around transit-oriented manufacturing. Uh, this really relates back um, to the, the potential, the proposed location of the light rail uh, station in the manufacturing industrial center. Uh, and just sort of an example of this, um, of kind of what we're trying to resolve is um, kind of a story. In, in 2017, when we were starting the, the subway planning process, uh, we heard a lot about how preserving industrial lands in the city of Tacoma uh, was really one of the preeminent issues of our time. And, and then many of those same people that, that were saying, this is the issue that we need to resolve um, within a matter of months, once it was sort of released that there was a potential uh, light rail station proposed in the manufacturing industrial center, those same people pivoted immediately from preserve industrial lands to rezone to accommodate TOD. And, and so that's the kind of like shift in public imagination that often happens. So part of what we're trying to explore are, are there alternatives to uh, how we manage the relationship between housing, TOD, in manufacturing and industry that we could utilize within that specific circumstance. Um, I won't talk much about permit discretion versus prescription, but this is something that's really important as we go through this process um, for um, our community. How much can our permit and development standards really prescribe uh, standards for um, industry and for a very broad uh, variety of different types of industries and sectors um, versus kind of providing some discretion to provide targets uh, performance standards, and then allow flexibility for specific uses to really identify the best way to meet those standards. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we see some of these tensions really kind of having some of their core uh, as well within tensions between GMA, SMA, and Vision. Um, one thing I'll note, I mean, this is sort of a funny local circumstance again, but um, the container port element in GMA uses the term core area very specifically. Uh, but that term core industrial land use is also used within vision and they are related but a little bit different and we had some circumstances where we were developing materials that spoke to a core area and what kinds of uses should be allowed within that core area um, and it felt like at a conversational level like we just like staff consultant team were not quite on the same page with what that meant and it took us a while to realize that in my imagination what I was thinking of when I used the term core area and think of core industrial land uses, I was thinking back to the container port element and some of that specific language. Other folks though were really thinking back to vision and had a different idea and a different concept of what they meant, even though the terminology was fairly similar. Um, so there are some issues around that that we're trying to identify through this process. Um, lastly, and I'm not sure uh, kind of where I'm at on time, so I'm gonna um, kind of leave it to Ben to uh, cut me off if need be. Um, but I'm not, I don't want to go too, too far into detail on sea level rise, except to identify that um, we are planning for a, a four foot rise plus one foot of storm surge uh, sea level rise scenario. Uh, so the map here on the right kind of identifies areas and, and levels of flooding uh, based on that sea level rise scenario. And really just kind of wanted to utilize this as an example of kind of the, the necessity for the kinds of joint planning uh, that we're doing within the subway plan. So just sort of a recognition that um, you know, the, adapting to this level of flooding within the area, uh, the, the, the level of coordination and investment um, that will likely be necessary is not something where, you know, the city can just go it alone. Um, and, and hopefully this, I think, reinforces the need that all of the major players within this area really need to be operating off the same playbook in order to be able to really respond to some of the challenges uh, that we see uh, with sea level rise and with flooding in the future. Um, so again, um, happy, you know, if there's additional information on kind of where this data came from, uh, to be able to provide that. But I think that's the point I'm really looking at here is 
uh, really drives home, I think, the need for um, all of those major players to be on the same page about what the threat is and how we're going to respond to it. Oh. Um, and then that uh, kind of leads me into kind of a brief uh, discussion around the joint planning that we're conducting. So again, we have uh, a number of significant policy tensions that we're working through. I think that represent a lot of the differences of perspective and interest that we have in the tide flats. Um, and I think there's a really unique way that we are proposing to work through both those tensions as well as kind of the overall planning effort. Um, so we are conducting this plan, as I mentioned, as a joint planning effort for the City of Tacoma, Puyallup Tribe, Port, uh, Pierce County, and City of Fife. Um, we are co-funding it. Uh, so both the Port and Puyallup Tribe of Indians are contributing funding uh, to the effort. Um, and it's guided by an intergovernmental agreement and work plan. And one of the really unique attributes of that is the um, kind of the way that it's created really a forum uh, for staff, for the city and, and government leadership, as well as the electeds uh, to really share and develop information jointly and then make, make recommendations uh, back to the city of Tacoma for the ultimate summary plan. Um, so one of the keys to that is we have a steering committee that's comprised of two elected representatives from each government. Um, they have specific roles and responsibilities within the IGA and work plan. Um, everything from uh, kind of recommending the consultant team uh, to improving the public engagement plan uh, to developing and recommending the initial uh, alternative scenarios for the EIS um, and then ultimately to recommend the draft plan. Um, so this really puts a joint uh, kind of steering committee in the driver's seat of developing the plan um, and then they are supported by staff leadership and that's a, a team comprised of the executives from each of the governments um, and then we have a project management team, uh, which is comprised of the lead staff from each of the governments. So, um, and that management team has been meeting almost every two weeks for about three years now um, on this effort. Um, so what this really does is creates a space of cooperation, of information sharing, opportunities to share what our interests are, our perspectives on this area, um, and hopefully um, really set to, to be able to set us up. So we, um, from the, from the get-go have, um, an opportunity to really create a common understanding of the issues we're trying to resolve, you know, those problem statements, the options we have to resolve those. And then ultimately, even if there are uh, disagreements at the end of the day on what the appropriate policy actions are that we should take uh, to address those issues, um, then we'll have a fuller understanding of why we have those disagreements, what they mean, um, and an understanding of, of the interests and impacts uh, more fully and completely um, than otherwise. Um, and that's uh, kind of leads me then I think to kind of my last slide here and then I'll kick it back to Ben um, on the range of alternatives. So this is kind of the first step that the steering committee has taken to really draft uh, a range of alternatives that really represent their different interests and is really kind of poised to help us then advance uh, better understanding some of those policy tensions and the options we have to try to resolve those. So again, I'm not going to go into detail on those. Uh, but to learn more on that, uh, we are currently in our scoping phase. All those materials are available on our website at Tide Flats uh, Plan. Um, and feel free to reach out to me directly for any more information. So again, not sure on the time, but I'll kind of kick it back uh, to Ben. I think I may have gone a little bit long. That is more, more than okay. I think that was <laughs> well, well worth it to hear, hear about this plan here. Um, thank you. Thank you again, Steve. Um, we'll turn it over to Dan from Everett. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Ben. And and you're right. That was an incredible presentation. And um, I'm not going to even try to match it. However, since I'm here, I'll talk about some stuff. So uh, I am not really a planner. I'm more of the doer on the economic development side. And uh, Hopefully this is helpful. I, I looked at the list of people who are assembled here. Not all of you are from great big cities like Seattle, Tacoma, um, and don't have the, the overall staff. I tried to just make my comments really, uh, I guess, simple and just how to unlock some of these industrial lands. And uh, I'm going to be focused both in the past, building on um, kind of legacy industrial pro uh, properties, but also and fighting for the future with the with the different tensions that are going on. Hopefully this is helpful. Feel free to uh, throw things in questions or comments in the uh, chat or in the Q&A. So 
Everett, when I was growing up in Des Moines, um, my dad was from Tacoma and, and uh, my mom was from Seattle. And we used to always poo-poo both Tacoma and, and Everett in that order just because they smelled really badly. And uh, it was because of all the legacy mill sites and, uh, and activity going on in the industry. And I, I think in the ethos of the Seattle mindset, the industry equals smelly, nasty, obnoxious stuff. Um, that has changed over time. Here's 1914, Everett, old Everett, the uh, downtown that you think of, um, I mean, that we think of as the uh, downtown part, looks like a thumb sticking straight due north and uh, Snohomish River Basin comes and wraps around it and Puget Sound and the Salish Sea is, is on to the west. Um, 1975, when I was growing up, it wasn't much different. Still a lot of uh, familiar names, a lot of resource manufacturing type stuff. This picture has completely changed in the last couple decades. Um, and it hasn't always been easy, but it is changing. Um, some of you, if you're a South Park fan, you'll appreciate knowing that uh, I wasn't the only one who came by Everett when I was growing up. The creator of South Park was inspired by a tire fire on the old dump site in Everett and uh, brought it to Springfield. And uh, that is one of the one of the legacy sites that we're working on right now. So what makes for a gold star redevelopment of these legacy mill sites and, and uh, natural resource smelters, all the, all the different stuff? Um, first, I think you need a public sector, uh, a knowledgeable public sector that can reduce uncertainty for redevelopment. Um, ultimately, someone is going to have to invest in that property, probably from the private sector, and uncertainty will kill the deal. And so if you can be proactive, think like, okay, what will they need um, to invest in this property? Probably you're going to be uh, patient, get money from grants. Um, there is grant money out there for brownfield redevelopment. I think the second thing that you have to do is look at market demand. And this is not a static thing. Uh, market demand is not something that, that we have no um, control over as, as cities and as uh, municipalities and certainly as states. Our laws, our policies, are they, they encourage certain kinds of industry. And right now, our buyers, our, our shoppers are encouraging lots of distribution. Um, and so lots of logistics distribution demand is happening. If our state code, if our B&O tax, if our, if our uh, incentives are uh, tilted toward encouraging industry, ind the market demand will be affected. If they are not, they'll find other places to do that. And, and that, you know, I, I hate to, to overemphasize this because I don't think it's, you know, there's lots of forces with market demand. But at the same time, if we have a, a setting that is unhealthy for the very types of things that we're talking about today, uh, we're not going to get very far. And then finally, it really helps to have a developer come to the table who has experience with redeveloping brownfield sites and, and things like that. They, I, they usually have patient equity. And what I mean by that is someone who is willing to invest in something doesn't need a return in two or three years. They're willing to wait for maybe five to 10 years. Uh, realistic timelines with permitting, knowing how long it takes to get through the Corps of Engineers permitting and everything. And then they can become in a, in a proper relationship, even if it's not a formal PPP relationship, they become a, a helpful team member um, getting the project done. Because as much work as it did on the, you know, reducing uncertainty on bullet point number one, there's still other things to do when the uh, actual development takes place. So here's some of the gold star development, that tire fire site that is right on the, on the east side of I-5. As you're heading north, you, if you go right now, you'll start to see uh, some of the buildings going up that's going to be kind of like a small Mill Creek Town Center, um, lifestyle center, lots of housing, probably about um, we've already got two of the developments, the townhomes and the 
single family detached already built, but then about 1200 more um, mid rise five over one uh, stuff's going up with, uh, with some, you know, lifestyle type stuff. And we're actually, the city is funding a, a pier going out in the Snohomish River, which will be really the first access to the Snohomish River that Everett residents have had for eons because of all the uh, manufacturing going on. Um, where this is one of the warehouse or mill sites, we're looking kind of to the uh, southwest a little bit. And this is one that one of the great partners we had was the Port of Everett, who, who took down a lot of these former mill sites with a lot of environmental problems. And with their expertise at dealing with the core and, and all the different um, environmental uh, ish, uh, agencies that are out there, they made this available. And you can see there's, there's guess what, distribution, but also Saffron is uh, aerospace manufacturing. Um, there's, uh, in farm, which is doing indoor agricultural down there. There's, uh, yeah, there's some other stuff too. Mostly all big square buildings with high ceilings. Kimberly Clark had a site right down on the Everett waterfront. This, uh, the thing that looks like a pitchfork going out in the sea is uh, Everett Navy home port. And then the yellow site is about, a, yeah, I can't remember, 80 acre. Um, Kimberly Clark pulp mill that was nasty for a long time and just vacant and uh, Port of Everett is redeveloping that and that'll be the Norton Terminal. Here's another site that was former lum uh, lumber mill had a lot of environmental problems and uh, Latitude 47 is put up that building so uh, guess what distribution. Um, redevelopment sites to come right next to that that Baywood was the one that you were just looking at. And then this gelled one site is uh, a little bit larger site. Um, and that is, we just had a pre-app with a, with a developer who is one of those uh, great experienced development partners that is coming to us all the way from uh, New Jersey. And guess what? There's lots of um, uh, brownfields back there and they're very experienced and they have patient money. Smith Island Terminal, um, Cedar Grove Composting has one of the, the most advanced composting um, operations going on on Smith Island. There's no real sewer out there. It's very uh, low to the ground and, and um, they have raised this site and uh, this big yellow circle is a uh, what they call the Smith Island Terminal, and it's it's basically a railroad loop, one mile railroad loop that goes twice, so it's two miles. So you can take a train off the main line and uh, load it and unload it. We haven't had that ability, and it's a it's a great operation that's coming on. It's years in the making, and uh, there's work to be done to connect to 529 um, more advantageously with a lot of uh, a lot of trucks that are going to be uh, coming on and off. We just got a pre-app for this site again. We don't really have sewer, but there's such strong market demand for industry right now that uh, the developer is is investigating what sewer or uh, something like it will take. I, I don't know the details on that. So if you put that question in, I'll, I'll just have to defer to somebody else. I'm not exactly sure what they're proposing. Um, this is a... Uh, a former Kimberly Clark mill site as well. And, and uh, this is one that the city acquired 60 acres on and we're looking to move our public works facility, which currently is a 15 acre development right by a light rail station in downtown Everett. And we're hoping to move it to this site. Um, and then we'll have some leftover um, property too that we can sell to the private sector for redevelopment and uh, go from there. And I know green is not a great name for everything, but it's catchy with epic green. I think it's really going to be a nice, nice title. Um, the only problem is we can't get to this site except for going at, at grade over the BNSF railroad. So we have to invest in a 15 to $20 million bridge um, before the fire marshal will allow us to go vertical. So our work right now is largely on the bridge. And like I say, all of these sites come with as we say in the development world, they all have hair on them. And uh, they, 
it, it's really a collaboration between the public and the private sector to get these things back into uh, useful work because what you see right there is what it's been for a couple decades, a whole lot of nothing. And uh, that can probably support thousands of jobs. It can support lots of businesses and uh, can be really a productive site. So that's kind of a backward look at some of the things going on in some of those mill sites around the North Everett. Um, but we're also looking to the future and, and uh, with Jeff and Steven's presentations, obviously there's a whole lot of planning going on. Um, for me, a lot of the work is around light rail. And right now we're right in the thick of planning for an extension to Everett that won't really get to us for a long time. In fact, we're hopeful in Everett that we will be producing um, commercially viable fusion energy prior to the light rail arriving, which is a, kind of a sad state of affairs, but I mean, it's happy. Both of them are happy, but it just takes a long time to get light rail. So in Everett, we have the largest manufacturing facility in the world. Um, it's the Boeing Everett plant. It is the biggest room or however you want to measure it. We've got 30,000 employees. So one would think that it would be an obvious thing to come off I-5. This pink line is what the voters approved for ST3 to serve um, these workers. But as things are going in the planning, that's being questioned. And, and you know, not to fault Sound Transit, not to fault anybody, but as one of my uh, co-panelists said, kind of the normal default with transit-oriented development is, is uh, residential and uh, walkable places. And, and it, is, it is resistant to jobs with the exception maybe of downtown Bellevue, downtown Seattle. Um, kind of urban jobs people get, but to serve the uh, manufacturing centers, that's a little different, and it requires, frankly, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, political will to continue the path of the light rail and, and so forth and transit um, to serve these areas. Another thing that happens is. As our transit network grows, so do the operation maintenance facilities that serve it, not only from the, from the uh, light rail side, but also from the bus side. More buses means more bus yards and places to fix them. This is, uh, we're planning for a 60 acre operations maintenance facility in the north end somewhere, and that hasn't been cited yet. But it's, it's a, we're grappling with the with the compromises necessary to locate such a such a site. And what do you give up? You know, Sound Transit's very sensitive about um, displacing residential, um, especially low income residential. They're but they're not so resistant to displacing jobs. And so, at least I you know honestly, I think it's probably just where they've been bitten the hardest in the past, they're just very sensitive to, uh, to that, that whole world and we all are. And so how do you, how do you fight for the future of industry? And this is, this just shows, you know, all the different, and I shouldn't say all the different, some of the different factors that they're weighing to consider the different siting of, of the 60 acre facility. Some of these locations, would land right on uh, highly valuable MIC property that is uh, uh, supporting the largest manufacturing facility in the world and the aerospace cluster that is such an economic engine for the Puget Sound region. Well, uh, I said planning before, but I, when I realized I'm not much of a planner after Jeff and uh, after Jeff and Stephen went, I. Uh, change it to fighting in two out of the three slides, but I didn't get this one. So this should be fighting for industrial uh, lands. First of all, fight for the underdog, transit oriented industry or manufacturing or whatever you want to call it. Um, just orient those jobs. Second thing, highlight the, the unique, irreplaceable value really of industrial lands. Um, it, it, they, 
the the multiplying effect on those the the type of uh, people that that are supported through that is is really unique. Allow in light industrial uses on BRT connected corridors. I think a lot of times we talk only about the you know the quarter mile half mile around a transit light rail station. We really need to remember that those light rail stations can easily be served with BRT, and that connects you know Highway 99 that goes through ever. Seattle and Tacoma and all the way down to Mexico and all the way up to Canada, you know, so a lot of those can be served very efficiently with BRT and connect to the to uh, a lot of jobs, a lot of housing, a lot of a lot of people. So at least the on the light industrial uh, really, really think about that and how that goes. Those corridors are going to be continually churning on especially as the retail market goes you know sites that you know we have fluke on on in the, on our uh, evergreen way which is highway 99 there and it kind of looks like an old walmart you know it's 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 it it fits in that setting it works in that setting it provides a ton of jobs and it provides a ton of manufacturing we have to as some of my other co-presenters said we got to differentiate jobs. Um, 400 jobs that Walmart provides are different than 400 jobs that a operation maintenance facility provides are different than 400 jobs that um, Saffron or Saffron or, or, or an aerospace provider provide like um, Magnex or something who's making electric um, airplane um, engines. So we have to differentiate those. And how do you differentiate? Well, you have to educate decision makers on industry clusters and how there's this infrastructure of dependent companies. There's a network of workers and knowledge base that are, that are surrounded and need for physical proximity. And frankly, with so many great examples of that in the Puget Sound region, we just have to really be pointing them out and just reminding people of, of those things. Like, for example, Everett Aerospace, Renton Aerospace, we have the South Lake Union with the biotech and global health. We have the maritime industry. We have blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it could go on. We don't have you know, an endless supply, but uh, cloud computing is a unique tech um, industry that we are really, really good at, and we need to protect it. Uh, frankly, it's a little bit easier to protect <laughs> that, that cluster uh, on a on a space level than it is some of the industrial things that, that require uh, large spaces and, and uh, have environmental impacts. Finally, I'll leave you with Bozo, my mentor, my hero. Um, I believe that everybody should have uh, a blow up Bozo, at least in their mind, if not in their office, because uh, Bozo, no matter how many times he gets punched, he, he uh, lets off a small nose squeak and then uh, pops back up with a big smile on his face and, and uh, is ready to face the, the next day with uh, new solutions. So with that, I'll give it back to Ben. Thank you, Dan. I really liked uh, how you closed that there. I have to say, I was expecting maybe at least one or two Funko Pops given your presence in Everett, but I think Bozo, oh, there we go, okay. But I think Bozo is definitely serves the purpose. Um, I just want to say thank you again to our three panelists. I thought the presentations were all fantastic. Um, we are just a few minutes behind, but I think we still have plenty of time for questions. So let's go ahead with a five minute break. Uh, we'll reconvene at 1127, um, actually 1128, excuse me. Um, and in the meantime, please continue to add your questions to the q and I'm seeing a few come in now, some great questions. So looking forward to getting into those um, at 11.28 when we return.
Okay. Um, thanks for those who are sticking around for the Q&A. I think it's time to jump in. Um, so the first question, and I will promote it so everyone in the audience is able to see it, um, comes from Rob Allen, and the question is, and I believe this was during Jeff's presentation, um, is the intent for urban industrial uh, types of industrial land uses to only be in the mix, or are there opportunities um, outside of mix or in other transition zones? And for everyone else, please feel free to jump in as well. Yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> there are a few places outside of the mix where we're looking at that, that zone. Um, and it's interesting because there are a number of community members who um, would like would like to see that sort of um, land use mix in more places. Um, there's certainly an interest in kind of makers, arts, um, and that sort of thing in um, you know kind of neighborhood nodes. So um, yeah, we're looking at it in a few places and that are outside of the mix. Great, thank you. Um, and if anyone else, uh, I know kind of similar uh, similar issues in um, in each of your other cities. So if there's if there's other wisdom you'd like to impart, <laughs> but um... yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just jump in really quick, Ben. I, I guess I'd just say, um, well, this is not really part of the summary plan. Um, kind of around that question around prioritization of industrial uses in the tide flats. Um, you know, a lot of our community conversations, but this is a waterfront deep water port. So there are particular kinds of uses we should be prioritizing only in this area. Um, at the same time, recognize we have a lot of, you know, wholesale trades, uh, you know, building supply companies in the tide flats, a lot of other kind of light industrial uses. Um, so part of what we expect is if, if we do want to prioritize specific types of uses for the tide flats location, um, do we need to be considering um, even within our commercial districts, you know, within the city more broadly, uh, changes to provide allowance for uh, relocation of some of our other light industrial uses to other parts of the city. So certainly see that there's going to be a um, kind of a, a, a network effect of any changes that happen in the tide flats could result in kind of reconsidering other zoning to better accommodate those other kinds of uses. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question comes from Martin Hansen, um, and it's also directed at Jeff, but I think um, also is something that would be uh, good to hear from everyone. Um, and it touches on some of the things we've heard a bit more today, um, specifically about rapid transit and um, how that can factor in with industrial land use. So the question is, uh, how can the city of Seattle consider compatibility of uses in mixed use light industrial developments around rapid transit stations and neighborhoods. Uh, what industrial uses are expected to be allowed in these mixed use office slash commercial buildings and mixed use buildings with residential? Um, and are there any other tools or measures being used to uh, kind of address those compatibility issues? Yeah, well, I was, pleased to see this issue of transit-oriented development for manufacturing industrial centers come up in all three presentations. I thought that was interesting. So um, I think it's very intriguing and something that's great to look at, you know, in our region, because I don't think we've really had to grapple with this as much in the past, and it's kind of a new issue. So it's really interesting. But I will say that our process, um, in Seattle um, is proposing a transit oriented development model for these areas that would be employment based uh, and not have housing. Um, and there's lots of back and forth and strong opinions on both sides of that issue about whether there should be some housing included. Um, but our stakeholder advisory groups recommendations and where it appears that um, we're headed with our policies is to um, kind of hold that line and envision a model of transit-oriented development that could be, you know, compact and walkable 
um, but you know, be about employment um, and the mix of the employment that we would see is that, uh, well, the proposal is to require the light industrial space to be built to a bona fide light industrial standard. So things like high floor to ceiling heights, um, uh, load bearing floors, freight elevators, um, and the like. So it would have to be constructed to a certain standard. Um, and it would have to be uh, a use that we would classify as an industrial use. And that could be a pretty wide range of things. Um, um, and I'll just share that we've, you know, the, the, the main city that we looked to here and talked with that had some interesting precedents was uh, actually Vancouver, British Columbia, who has a similar um, uh, incentive model. And uh, they've had, They've had some success um, with with that that model and getting um, you know good uptake uh, by tenants of that that required um, included light industrial space. So I'll just pause there. Dan, I know you uh, mentioned a lot or discussed a lot about um, kind of the, the challenges or just some of the things that are still up in the air with light rail in Everett. Uh, is sure. there anything you wanna discuss more about that? Well, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's an ongoing conversation and a lot of cities have done that. I was at the city of Shoreline prior to coming to uh, Everett as economic development director. And so uh, it eventually will get decided and it'll be a, compromise on a lot of fronts and you're balancing a lot of different um different things and it's it's a, a great exercise in in public involvement and uh and making decisions together so uh you know we just have to work through it uh, i just think there has to be advocates for industry has to be advocates for industrial lands because i Largely in this conversation, I think we just have a mindset of what TOD looks like, and it's it's uh, it's vertically in um, multi mixed use industry is typically not vertically mixed use; it's usually horizontally mixed use, and to just kind of like blanket say TOD has to be vertically mixed use with you know different uses over and under each other. I, I think it's just a turnoff to, to uh, industry. And again, if you're trying to create strong demand for industry, then you have to look at that code and you have to figure out how do I serve this with transit more horizontally. And to me, the solution is to think in terms of barbells rather than of, of radiuses around light rail stations. And when I, when I say that, I mean, Sure, you have the quarter mile or half mile that you're planning for around a light rail station, but then connect those light rail stations to each other um, with BRT routes and think about Highway 99 or or Everett Mall Way or Broadway or or these really, uh, you know, we all we all know what they are in our own community, um, but we have these amenity corridors that provide lots of trans, uh, transportation concurrency that provide a lot of places for live, work, uh, shop, errands, all these things to happen um, in fairly close proximity, you know, for a, a sh fairly short walk. And to, to think about those as a, as a really an active network, and, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but we just have to have to really advocate for the job side of those and for the high value jobs that you know really we've uh, it, it, that PSRC is documenting with all your work on how, why these are such critical things in our in our ecosystem and uh, we have to advocate for them we have to fight for them and and we we just have to be that voice if we're not then I think the default will be that every light rail station looks pretty similar. You know, it has a grocery store on with five stories of residential on top. And, you know, if you have that, then you're really thinking about how do I make the 
the space um, multimodal safe to bikers and and everything and you're instantly in a setting where big semi trucks and forklifts don't live and and so there has to be some other um, models of transit oriented development that include semi trucks i mean for for lack of a better way to say it yeah, I appreciate that answer a lot. I, I will say we've had conversations at PSRC for through our industrial lands update with everyone on this call here. Um, and they've all mentioned this concept of transit oriented manufacturing, but it's something we've heard pretty much across the board. And Dan, I just really appreciate how you uh, kind of called out some of those things that need to be considered differently than when you're thinking of that more traditional TOD with um, residential or mixed use types of development. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, before I move to the next question, just wanted to give Steve an opportunity to, to answer, but um, also happy to move on. No, I'll, I'll just say I really appreciate the comments from uh, from Jeff and Dan on that. Um, I mean, we, we are a jurisdiction, we have some, uh, some zoning districts and some circumstances currently where we allow kind of a TOM concept. Um, but we really don't have kind of lessons from those circumstances that we can apply because um, we really just have not gotten recent development within those areas it would kind of help us identify whether or not the zoning we have is effective. Um, and in fact, the lack of development may reflect that the kinds of standards uh, or concepts that we've used in those kind of TOM uh, scenarios have really not been effective to allow uh, development to happen in accordance with that, that kind of vision. So. Um, that's one of the aspects we're kind of dissecting and, and just to, to Dan's point about the vertical, uh, you know, lack of vertical industrial uh, uses. We have uh, zoning now where we, you can build industrial or you can build residential, but the residential has to have a ground floor industrial use. And I'll just tell you, there are not many folks walking through the door who are looking to build an industrial residential mixed use project. Um, so again, potentially some lessons there, but that's something we really have to dissect to figure out kind of what, you know, what's going on in those areas. Yeah, I, I'd like to add just one, one thing on this, which is um, in Seattle, we're, you know, we're also considering um, you know, updating essentially the definition of what an industrial use is. And so, you know, a, a more traditional understanding you know, you think of, you know, trucks and forklifts um, and other, you know, fairly heavy processes. But, um, you know, we are um, looking at how we may be more flexible to account for, um, you know, lighter industrial type uses. A lot of them are, these days are still at, are at a computer station, for example, where you're, you know, working or designing uh, an, an industrial product, um, but it doesn't look and feel that much different than an office job. But could you differentiate from an economic standpoint, you know, productive uh, industry versus, say, um, um, you know, a law office um, or an accountant, you know, which is clearly not industrial. Um, you know, so we're kind of looking at that. And, and the other things that fit into that perhaps more lighter understanding of industrial are, you know, some of the craft and maker things like, you know, breweries, for example, or um, an outdoor sporting goods company that's just doing sort of prototyping um, of the product on site. <clears throat> so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of add that to, you know, share some of the thought process around um, a mix of industry with other other uses. Great, thank you all. I thought that was a great set of responses. Um, so moving on, we have a question from Robin Chang. Um, and I think it is, and feel free to clarify in the comments again, if I'm getting this right. Uh, but I think the question is asking if there might be a need or, um, perhaps some discussions around um, creating new management structures for these industrial areas, particularly as they're getting more uh, complex, allowing for uh, more nuanced types of land uses. 
Um, so thinking things of like a district management, uh, a sub agency of those kinds of things, if that might be a helpful uh, way to manage uh, industrial lands better. Well, I'll just start off. Um, I don't think I have a great answer, but I, I will say that there is a that there are existing organizations. Um, there's a manufacturing industrial council in Seattle, which is essentially a membership organization. Um, there's also a business business improvement area in the Soto neighborhood, um, and I think those organizations are looking at um, evolving. Um, and perhaps combining some of their efforts with the Seattle's other uh, manufacturing industrial center around Ballard. So there, there is some interest in updating those management structures here. So that's a good question. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I guess, jump in here for a minute. Um, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's a great question. Again, I don't have a kind of a definitive answer on this, except to say that, I think the question is sort of top of mind in Tacoma. Um, I mean, we have essentially created a new governance structure for the development of the plan um, itself. Um, and, and I can tell you, I mean, and this is, uh, you know, something that's entirely new for me, I think entirely new for the city to be working um, really to co-produce a plan like this versus kind of the traditional route planning commission, city council and other governing uh, bodies have an opportunity to comment and kind of raise uh, concerns kind of through that process, um, you know, to the point where, you know, there are times where it almost feels like staff to five different governments. Um, at the same time with that, you know, it's really top of mind for us is, you know, we've established this framework. Um, and once the plan is done, how do we make sure that that persists? Um, that the collaboration that's occurring currently, that the, the development of shared priorities um, is not something that ends kind of with the planning effort. Um, so that's certainly I think going to be part of the, the dialogue with the steering committee, uh, with the five governments is um, what do we really need to make sure that the kinds of, um, you know, forum that we've created for ourselves uh, is really resilient and persists beyond just the development of the subway plan itself. So uh, that's really an open question for us. Does it look the same when all is said and done? Uh, or are there changes that we would kind of consider, uh, you know, potentially creating a formal um, ongoing committee. Um, there's some of the ideas on the table. That's great, thank you. Um, so I think we'll move on. Uh, Kim Dietz has asked, um, this is also directed to Jeff um, at Seattle, but again, would love to hear uh, from the panel generally. Um, but can you talk more about uh, mixed use industrial areas with office incentives and maybe something you touched on um, just a minute ago, but also what are the public benefit, uh, what are the public benefits that are married to the density increases uh, and what are some of the light manufacturing uses that you've seen or heard interest in and I think it might be a rehash of what you've just answered but um, wanted to give an opportunity to answer this question. Uh, great. Well, the uh, the proposed concept, and again, this is in the planning phase. So, you know, I'm I'm telling you about things that are in the works that we haven't um, seen implemented yet. But the the proposal is to, you know, essentially have an inclusionary structure so that the uh, well, the high value, higher rent. Uh, generating uses here, you know, are you know, tech um, companies, software development, um, principally, but other other things like that. So, you know, those aren't currently allowed to to be, you know, a use in our industrial areas. So, the proposal is to upzone, um, allow for those uses, but. Um, to build them, you, the developer has to include um, a certain amount of bona fide um, new light industrial space. So in a sense, um, allowing those higher value uses um, subsidize the, pro the production of new 
light industrial space. And to Dan's point, yes, I showed a picture of vertical, but it could also be you know horizontal so that maybe you have a large site and you have an office building uh, and you know have a on another portion of the site, you know, a light industrial structure. Um, <clears throat> but you know your, your question about public benefit is good too, because um, to some extent, the public benefit would be, the incent, the new bona fide light industrial space, and retaining um, or creating new new jobs and economic activity. Um, so that's one component. But another component would be um, the city receiving that new investment in areas where we have old infrastructure that gets upgraded, street improvements, um, <clears throat> you know, sewer and stormwater drainage um, that the development would would um, pay for. Um, so that's a part of it. And then there's dialogue about whether um, that development should also contribute to our city's affordable housing program, for example. Um, but uh, at a staff level, we're recommending that um, we regard the new bona fide light industrial space as a benefit of sorts, as well as those infrastructure improvements. Great. Um, just wanted to flag that um, there was a question that Dan has typed an answer to um, and kind of asking about the impacts of climate change and tidal impacts, um, the unfortunate reality of climate change causing increased sea levels. Um, and so wondering, you know, we heard from Steve at Tacoma about the efforts made to kind of um, build up the uh, build up walls, uh, similar kinds of things happening in Everett, um, just recognizing the reality of climate change on our industrial lands and the potential impacts to our economy. Um, next question we'll take a look at, um, and this is one I think that would be good to hear from everyone and something we have certainly heard about in our discussions. Um, so on the topic of transportation networks, are we seeing need to address traffic pattern changes in industrial lands uh, beyond just public transit and light rail? Um, you know, we're seeing increases in trucking, uh, distribution, logistics, and how that's really impacting industrial lands and the communities surrounding them. So I'd love to hear from folks about that. I'll go first with kind of a non-answer. We haven't seen it. Uh, significant, um, you know, displacement or anything or public outcry from the the herds of uh, Amazon buses going out from distribution centers and things like that. We are working on, uh, as I think Seattle is, alternative methods of delivering products, and uh, those will create their own their own share of conversations. We have the new little uh, scout guys that go along the sidewalks and stop in front of your house and then you come out and get your package and those are being developed and uh, we have a lot of robotics in Everett and so um, those are being developed in Everett and of course Seattle I think is location for the drone delivery um, uh, development so uh, at least they're not trucks. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll, just, I'll jump in really quick. I'm not the transportation guy at the city of Tacoma, so I, I can't probably speak uh, super intelligently on kind of what uh, we're currently seeing and any, um, you know, kind of, kind of changes in, in uh, you know, transportation demand uh, within the tide flats. It's certainly something that may come out with some of the modeling um, and data work that we're going to be doing. Uh, you know, I would probably just highlight, though, I mean, I think the, the issue on the kind of the distribution centers and some of the shifting nature of that is is more just from a land use standpoint in the, in the city as we've heard that teed up more as a, um, you know, sort of a question about what's the highest and best land use within the Tide Flats. And so, you know, for the Port of Tacoma, you know, distribution facilities are uh, kind of a key part of the supply chain. Um, at the same time, we've got a lot of other community segments that sort of look at that and say, well, is that really um, necessary to locate or allow those facilities within the Tide Flats, or should we be prioritizing, you know, more, um, 
you know, manufacturing activity instead of that kind of distribution. So um, that, that's been kind of emerging as a land use consideration within the area. Um, not so much to this point yet in terms of, um, I think kind of the, the Amazon experience of kind of some of that changing model of, of uh, delivery service, uh, at least within the, the area where I'm working in. And I'll add um, in Seattle, uh, especially, you know, for my port colleagues who may be, you know, on the call today, like we, we hear loud and clear that um, from the uh, industrial and maritime stakeholders that freight movement um, is a huge priority and uh, it's a real challenge um, <clears throat> because, um, you know, freight trucks moving on the street get caught in congestion um, and because of safety. And we've had, a, you know, a real challenge ensuring safety for all modes, um, especially on freight corridors. So, um, you know, there's a real strong understanding that there needs to be um, significant investments in maintaining and improving freight movement networks. And so that's something we're working on. And it's very costly is the main barrier. Um, but yeah, that's a, a key issue here. Definitely more to come on transportation in our uh, regional update, industrial lands update. Um, we just have about five minutes left and two questions to get through. Um, so let's try to try to do our best to answer them um, as best as we can. Um, so I think the first question we'd like to, to pose, and this one is directed to Dan, but again, um, open to all. Um, and it's asking what, uh, in your experience, what development incentives are having the biggest impact or are the most useful for um, the actual developers and actually um, attracting development? Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to answer this one. I, I, I'm very much, as you probably figured out, a somewhat of a contrarian. Um, so it may be a different answer than you ever heard. But number one is just have a really good permitting process. Uh, that is, uh, if you can get it through quickly with a lot of uh, uncertainty removed, uh, everyone will love you in the development world. Number two, the multifamily property tax exemption is really a powerful tool. And uh, that uh, I, I'm always shocked when cities say, oh, we don't want to give that out because I, I feel like that's that's one that you know you actually are getting an infused matching dollars from other um, from other municipalities and areas in the in the state um, to help development in your city. So that to me is a is a no brainer. Um, there are obviously a lot of federal incentives that bring dollars, but let's talk since this is planners. Let's talk about code incentives. I always feel like they're bass backwards, and this is my contrarian coming out. I think you want people to build tall if you're going for density. And I'm talking mainly uh, housing, not, not industry here, but let's talk, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You want it to be big, right? Um, if they're gonna develop that site, I mean, if every layer they put on that site is they're actually growing your city and it's going to be bigger forever you know if it's a hundred thousand square foot uh, floor plate and they put 10 of them on there that's a million square feet that they just added to your city so why would you only incentivize i mean why would you make them work harder the higher they go to me put the lead qualifications on people who only build one story um, otherwise, what you're doing along your highway corridors, for example, where a lot of stuff gets built, you're encouraging wall, the Walgreens of the world to build single story with surface parking. Because if they go up higher, they have to do bonus sense densities and things like that. And it actually gets harder as you go up. I, I just don't get it. I get, you know, certainly in a low rent city like Everett, we will never have people taking advantage of of bonus density for, for different things. 
because our rents aren't high enough to justify the added cost of going up generally. You know, there's a there's some break-even points in construction, but you know, once you get to five over one, you know, it's pretty much you're done. You're not going to go any higher. And so for us to get somebody to penetrate the 80 foot barrier or whatever in cost, why would I make them build a more expensive building? I, I just don't get that. So I've made my point now 12 different ways that the, I, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm still just mystified by it. And so I would say, remove, just let the code be the code if you're gonna to build to the height limit and, uh, and then go on. In other words, punish people who don't build to the height limit. I'm just going to empathize with 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 Dan here, and, and kind of based on the the comment, I'm going to assume that Tacoma's code is probably bass backwards. I got to remember that. Um, but I think it's a great. I mean, even though we've constructed our code probably exactly how you've described it, Dan, in a lot of ways, um, I think it's a great question. Uh, you know, as a policy consideration is what's the public benefit is the public benefit kind of what's get what gets tacked on to a project in order to build to the height or is building to the height and, and kind of maximizing the development potential part of the public benefit to begin with and that's um I think it's certainly something we're starting to grapple with kind of within our kind of broader code construct around the mfte and height bonuses and things like that so i just want to say even as a planner i really appreciate that perspective and it's a you know really worthwhile question to ask. Well, and if we can have just a another second of dialogue, mm -hmm. I think there was a time when nothing got built that was very you know energy efficient or anything um, because the code didn't require. But our code now, if you build just to basic code, you're building a pretty good building um, for environmental things. Certainly, you know, and, and so I. I think we have that going for us, which maybe in the past, the, the code was, you know, the incentives were trying to like make models of, of better, better buildings. Thank you. I thought that was a great uh, dialogue there. Um, we are right at noon. Um, so unfortunately that puts us at an end of our, our discussion here. There are a few questions that uh, we didn't get to, so apologies, um, but please uh, do email us if you uh, have any more thoughts or ask or have any other questions for us. We will be sure to post the presentation recording along with the slides, um, as well as all of our email addresses. Um, we'll likely send it to you on Monday since it is already the end of the week, um, but just wanted to make sure that folks had an opportunity to follow up if they wanted to. Um, I just want to say thank you again to our panelists uh, for a really, truly fantastic discussion today. Um, it's been a little while since PSRC has held a similar discussion on industrial lands. Um, so I thought it was great to, for us to jump back into it. And I will just say, um, please stay tuned for more work from us in this space. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, so please feel free to email me um, if you want to discuss our work here. Um, or if you want to reach out to any of the folks on this call. Um, and with that, I will let everyone go. Hopefully um, folks can get out and enjoy this very sunny Friday uh, day that we have here. And everyone take care. Absolutely appreciate it. Take care. Thank you.